criteria to get into Singularity University, as uh, Mark alluded to you, one is to enter the competition, the Global Impact Competition. Uh, the other is to apply directly. Um, and as you can see, the number of applicants have been growing exponentially, and they select 80 people every year from 30, 35 to 38 countries. So it's based on your academic skill level. Having said that, 20% don't have degrees, because there are the people like Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs and so forth that actually decided that university wasn't for them. They just became entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs and also people who are very passionate about grand challenges. So this was my class, and you can see it was a very diverse uh, uh, class group. You have uh, back from Saudi Arabia, and this Palestinian girl was actually sponsored by Israelis who wanted to send a Palestinian to the program. Um, and this is where you play fine Clarence, like fine Wally. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in the, the 2011 group. Anyway, um, so you work on the, with, you know you, you you basically get taught by all the top people that you've uh, seen on TED Talks and so forth, and then you have to work in the final. Uh, it's a ten week program, and you live and eat in NASA. And your final uh, three to five weeks, you have to work on one of these areas: global health, water, energy, environment, food, education, security, poverty, and used to be space too, uh, to try and impact a billion people positively within ten years. So, you know, you have, you know, you have the curriculum, you go on site visits, you visit Google, you visit Facebook, you visit all these places out of Silicon Valley, and then you go to work on the project with some of the most brilliant people in the world. Um, they also run anxiety programs and so forth, um, and, you know, we'll hopefully run another competition this year in Australia. Last year, we didn't have any Australians in the program, which is why this year I wanted to make sure that we actually um, get the competition on uh, and get sponsors on board. And we did send an Australian to the program this year, and uh, happy to report that he did really well. Uh, his name is Azan Tan from Melbourne. Um, and here yeah, I'll talk a little bit of this project that they have planned. But anyway, coming back to exponential technology, as I said, you know, this is a, what a linear technology is. We, our mind is very, very focused on linear stuff. You know, like, you know, you finish chapter one, you go to chapter two, and so forth. <coughs> but think about this things are moving so fast, so rapidly, that by the time you, you know, go to step six, People are already on step 20 now, and, and the technology will keep on moving faster. And what are these technology? So you probably have seen some of this. This is a 3D printer. If you haven't seen one, you can go down to the Rubina uh, uh, Community Center opposite the library. There's uh, the Gokos Tech Center. They have two 3D printers out there. Uh, Alina can actually uh, tell you more about it. So an example is Stradivarius, right? The most, the, one of the rarest violins in the world. Um, Obviously, you, you know, there's only, there's only one, uh, there's only a few of them available in the world, right? But now, you can 3D scan the entire violin and 3D print so that you have an exact replica of what the craftsman created. Every nook and cranny in the, in the wood and so forth will be replicated. Um, so, this is actually very promising and I'll talk a little bit more about it. And then obviously, I, thought, I told you about singularity, right? About connecting your hardware to your wetware, your brain. So you could basically, or theoretically, very soon, download your entire brain into a computer. If you've got a crappy day, you just got to boot up and get, you know, into a day that you felt great. Just remember the backup. Okay, you guys know Watson? Uh, not the, uh, not uh, the sidekick for Sherlock Holmes, but Watson, the AI program from IBM. Uh, Watson was a, it's an artificial intelligence program. Um, that is so smart that they actually beat three, uh, two human contestants in the final of Jeopardy competition. You know, it, it one of the quiz shows in the U.S. And now it's actually being used to diagnose cancer better than human doctors. Mm -hmm. So in the very near future, you could essentially take your mobile phone, put a drop of blood, or you know, hold it and get your pulse and so forth, send it to the cloud. And Watson has read four million pages of medical journals. Can your doctor do that? And that actually tell you what you need to do. Um, so it's in the very near future, you know, GP's role might actually be diminished. The problem with our brain is that we still have a, we still have the remnants of the uh, amygdala, the reptilian brain. You know, when a lizard comes in a room, it looks around, right, looking for danger or food. And that's what we still have, right? Our fight or flight kind of mechanism. Um, and that's why we always look at negative news because that's how we survive and that's why news is always negative um, but I don't know what you've seen the positive stuff that's happened you know human life expectancy more than double you know uh, and today I just read that Bill Gates uh, actually published the uh, poverty rate in the world has fallen exponentially from like 70% down to like 22% or something like that now. 
China alone, like 850 million people living in poverty, 990, and now it's like down to less than 20 million or something, and then mm. down the track it'll be even less than that. So there's a lot of positive things that we don't seem to uh, appreciate. Uh, to give another example, and this is only comparing to 2000, right? It used to be that if you want to fly from Boston to Chicago or take a train or, or drive down there, it costs you a month's wage. It's like half a day wage now. A three minute phone call in New York to LA used to be 19 hours of work. This is 2000, right? Less than a minute. Now it's like free, right? If you use Viber or Skype or any of the other tools. So there are a lot of positive things that we don't seem to uh, take into account for. And this is just the Moore's Law. And, uh, you guys probably heard of Moore's Law, that computers power double every 18 months. So this is showing you uh, how it went from a uh, punch card to a uh, you know, silicon chip and so forth. But I don't know whether you know about this. The cost of sequencing in genes has fallen faster than Moore's law. Mm. It used to cost over a billion dollars to sequence your genes 10 years ago. Today, it's less than a thousand dollars. Okay, and why is this important? Because if you can sequence your genes, it will unlock a lot of information that we don't otherwise have. Do you, do you, have, you know, like you're, you're going to create a whole new field called pharmacogenomics, prescribing medication to you according to your genetic makeup. Because a lot of drugs that we are given, the dosage that we are prescribed, are tested on a small pool of people, mainly in the Western world. You and I may have certain genes that actually will react badly to it. You know, but everybody is getting the same dosage right now. And this is actually quite wrong. Have you ever wondered why the drug companies you know, don't call uh, the process of creating new drugs drug um, development? It's actually called drug discovery. Because they actually don't know how it works. They just try everything, and if it works, then you know they sell it, and they go for the testing. I mean, if you know the story about Cetanoxyl, right, Viagra, it was actually developed as a high pressure medication. They give it out to uh, for testing, for clinical testing, and then they decided that you know it was too expensive, and you know it wasn't worth competing in the market. There's so many blood pressure medicine out there, so they decided to recall the test. All the, we all the women testers gave it back. None of the men gave it back. <laughs> <laughs> Hence, Viagra was born. So that's rough discovery for you. 